Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have another family reunion. So this is our Thanksgiving. And Tom Wiscon is coming back to the family to tell us what he's been doing with his life. Um, I, I have to say is uh, I admire, like in, in the last semester with Elena did it and now Tom doing it, it requires a lot of courage to talk in your, in your house. It's not an easy thing, so I, I thank both of them. Particularly well, when you teach here, and particularly when you're in a leader, posi in a leader, in, in a position of leadership, it's not an easy task to come and talk in front of all your colleagues and students. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, I say it without any sense of joke, for real. I, I, I think, but also I think it's incredibly important for us to do these kind of things. It's important for us that we share with our colleagues what is what everybody thinking and doing and trying to operate. And this, I think, with the weekend of maintenance of Fabian Marcaccio opening last Friday and tomorrow the Homeless Symposium and Friday the Cloperan exhibition is a, is a, phenomenal, uh, is a phenomenal week, it's a, it's a whole series of events. And, and I think it, it, it connects people, like Tom Wiscon for sure is one of them, they are really serious, committed thinkers and practitioners on the many forms of speculations that we appreciate and we love here in SIARC. So when I was trying to think what to say and how to introduce Tom, uh, a whole series of thoughts came through my mind. I went through my usual clips and tried to find the right one. I couldn't find the right one for you, Tom. So I went a different road. And I was looking at stand-up comedy, and, and I came across a Stephen, a Stephen Wright, which I think is an interesting, very interesting guy. And he says, one of his, one of his quotes is, I was trying to daydream, but my mind kept wandering. And I think it's a, it's a good way to start to talk about the work on Tom Wiscombe and the aspiration of what we want from great architects and to operate. It's this idea that, in a way, one could argue that any act of architecture is a way of daydreaming. But at the same time, we get distracted and contaminated along the way with other things. And Tom has a very active uh, wandering mind. And this is some catalogs. I think he was going to be talking about that. So his mind has been wandering and get distracted in many other trajectories. Like many of us who came out of age as architects in a transition period moving from one way to understand design into another one, and I think we went into different phases in which contaminations and agencies that try to allow us to elaborate uh, different takes, Tom has done a remarkable work in this wandering. And there was a time that he was looking into uh, insect wings and, and tried to rethink a structure and many other qualities. For sure, he went through a wandering period of glowing creatures. Um, I'm not saying they all were equally successful. But these were incredibly important agencies of contamination in how to start to shape how he will operate. Uh, one, some other, some more, one more than others remain present. I think you will see that this is still is pretty much a theme. Um, I think it has to do with the aggressiveness, but also incredibly tenderness that Orga has. I think that can be talking about himself or his work. But also there was a time, and, and, and I think in one way or another also still thinking, the notion of tattoos. And more recent, um, um, he, he decided to go back to his childhood and rethink that. <laughs> this is incredibly important because I think architects are at their best when they're playing like child. Because when you're a child, you play seriously. You're not playing. It's your life. It's your commitment. So I think this is incredibly important, and I think to remain playful is incredibly uh, incredibly sophisticated. Uh, I don't want to, I, don't, I didn't want, and I don't want to do a long introduction because I think he has a lot of things to say. And really, um, he's a colleague and a friend that I admire deeply, and I consider one of the best designers and architects that I know. And I have, I'm very pleased and happy to share that venture to be in Sire in the same time that he's been around. I think he, he has been a phenomenal um, colleague to discuss and to bounce ideas. But the most important thing, I think there are people, and I cannot include myself, but I think Tom was born to be an architect. There are certain people that cannot be anything else but an architect. And I think I cannot think of a better compliment to give to somebody than that. I think Tom Wiscombe was born to be an architect. I, I not subscribe to everything that that thing said, but that's what you get in, in Google when you say, I was born to be an architect. <laughs> 
I was looking for some kind of a Bob Dylan to please Tom Main and that generation who seems so happy about Bob Dylan. I was looking for something more substantial, but this T-shirt came out. Uh, uh, but I, I think that the, most of them are pretty cool. Uh, but jokes aside, I, I want to close with this. I think the thing I, I admire the most, this is another great one. If at first, uh, if at first don't succeed, then skydiving definitely isn't for you. <laughs> what I mean by that is I think Tom keeps trying, and also depends what you mean by succeed. Uh, I don't think success is measured only in how many buildings you get to build, or how many clients you get to keep. It's the idea that you keep skydiving every time. And every phase of your career and every experiment or any crazy wondering that you can imagine. So I cannot say, please join me to welcome to Tom, because we're not going to welcome him to his home. But I'm really looking forward to see all the skydiving that he has to share with us. So Tom Wiscombe. Sorry, give me one second. Let me just test this thing. All right, right on. So, um, Hernan, thank you so much. That that was that was nice to um, uh, hear about my daydreaming. I I, I do daydream um, a lot, and um, I do try to always do something new in my work. Um, I I don't. I, I can't not do it that way. Um, I think that design is, a, is a, a process of discovery, and I try to make sure that in every project that we're doing in the office that, that, we're, that we're discovering something and having fun. Um, so I just want to quickly thank, Hernan, thank you, and also thanks to SciArc. Um, you know, I've been here for uh, uh, many, many years, and I started teaching here with my first teaching job under Neil Denari in the 90s. Um, and then worked uh, um, under under Eric Moss and now Hernan. So it's been like three generations, and and Sayark has been a lot to me um, uh, intellectually. All the colleagues that I have here and the ideas that I, that I um, am so lucky to hear and see around the building, and also just being taken care of by the school, um, e even in a um, uh, in a financial way over years allows you as a young architect to take risks that you might otherwise not be able to do. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, I also want to thank the students who have worked with me, who are here, you know who you are, and it makes a, a, a big difference for me, and I'm very proud to have you guys um, uh, helping me. And, um, and finally, I also just want to uh, uh, shout out to Dylan Weiser from my office, who's been a, a longtime employee of me, and a great help, and especially over the last few days putting this together, so thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, so let's get started. Um, tonight is Objects, Models, Worlds, and that'll make sense in a minute. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is that I did lecture here, but it was six years ago, and I didn't realize that until yesterday. Um, time flies. <laughs> and what I, what I wanted to go back and look at it very quickly is, first of all, how many slides did I have then? And second of all, um, uh, what the hell was I talking about, and d does it relate to what I'm doing now? And so um, it does, and, and I think that the lecture tonight um, uh, is, is really building on what I laid down in that lecture in 2013, and I'm happy to say that because I think that if you upend your own foundation and your own position every day of the week, then you can't get anything done. So, so I'm happy to say that. We made some minor edits. Uh, that's me down below trying to figure out what exactly changed, um, only f a few things. So I want to go, um, and also that, what came out of that lecture was important to me. It was a, a short article that I wrote called Discreteness or Toward a Flat Ontology of Architecture, um, which, which really laid down even more clearly, I think, the terms involved and, um, and I guess I would also argue how, how they could be art architecturalized. Um, so this is what's going on now in the office, which is a, a, a monograph uh, um, from the work of the last six years or seven years. 
and this is also kind of the structure of the lecture. So this is a preview for the book that'll be out in the spring, and it's structured the same way. Okay, so toward a flat ontology of architecture, what does that mean? Um, it means that it, it basically requires you to look at the world differently than, than you might normally. Um, it requires you to look at the world one thing at a time. Uh, I love this image because I, I always call this an eagle and an aircraft carrier, although I was just corrected today by Marika that that is not an eagle, in fact, that is a falcon. But the point is that, that you look at the world in terms of its organic life forms, its people, its ships, its aircraft carriers, its waters. Um, you start to look at everything one thing at a time instead of looking at things in terms of their relations and, um, and always um, in terms of, of uh, the larger systems that we might believe they're part of. And, um, and so that's, that's been a, a really important development in my mind um, over the last seven, six, seven years. And one of the main things of that is that you have to believe that things exist equally but differently in the world. Um, and and uh, uh, one of those, Graham isn't here tonight, but w um, one way that he likes to talk about this is through uh, overmining and undermining. Undermining is where you take an object in the world, you basically undermine it by breaking it down into its atoms. So in architecture, you might undermine architecture by breaking it down into its diagrammatic pro uh, uh, pieces. Um, or you might overmine it by saying like, well, that building was basically developed out of a, a, an urban system or a, a set of cont contextual relationships or other kinds of criteria from the top down. So I, I'm not a fan of either one of those. And I think that it's very important that we're able to look at architecture, one piece of architecture at a time, and that we're able to look at it closely and, um, and regard it. Um, collections have become very important for the office too. I, I think we're living in a kind of collection world um, and, and I think that we have, to be, we have to be collectors and also curators to just make sense of everything. But um, I, I like the idea that, um, that in this kind of collection from Mike Kelly, this is um, City 000, a great piece. It was actually, uh, that was over at the, um, at, the, at, the, um, at the gallery over there recently. Um, basically difference in kind over dis difference in degree. So what does that mean? It means that every single thing is, is different and unique, and you're not always trying to find the, the in-betweens or all of the connections between all of these individual pieces. This is a picture of my house, which I showed, I think, last week or the week before at Tim Morton's lecture. Uh, it's a picture of my house in the sense that it is, um, it is an idea of what my house is, it's all of the contents of the house, including the fountain, the fireplace, the cats, the cockroaches, everything, everything throughout the house. And, um, and I like, and I, this is me counting at the bottom, so everything is one. So the house, although it's much bigger, is one. The cockroaches are one by one. Everything's one. Um, so this is the, this is, <laughs> it was, Hernan, that was great that you found my old menagerie. So this is my menagerie currently. The menagerie is a way that I keep all of my daydreams flowing around. <laughs> And, um, and it's become a really important kind of, uh, um, not only a, a kind of an image of what a flat ontology looks like to me, but, but also a way of, um, of archiving our work and starting to understand the pieces and components of all the different projects in a single image. Uh, um, so it's a collection, and, um, and the, the parts are not necessarily related to one another. In fact, I would say they're kind of thrown down or thrown onto the page but they're, um, they're, I hope that they're signaling to one another and that they're feeding off of one another, but they remain discrete. This is kind of how the, the office has several of these vitrines. We, we collect, we make tons of plastic models. We call it the toy factory, actually. And the, the models uh, form their own kind of collection in all different colors and sizes um, in these vitrines, which are a kind of a, a, an instantiation of the menagerie. And this has also started happening this summer where the models that we're making are beginning to inhabit the walls as well. So we're having like drawings, renders, models, all these different ways of, of thinking and visualizing and representing projects all inhabiting even a vertical surface. So it's not the same thing as a cabinet of curiosities or a Wunderkammer um, where you might try to categorize things based on color or size or other kinds of things. Um, it's not about categories. It's about looking at the objects specifically one by one. So, um, so what does this all mean for architecture? Uh, um, this, is a, this is a diagram of, of how I read how a lot of architecture gets thought of and produced on the top vertically where you might develop a mass of a project 
and then the interior, then you might articulate the interior and the mass, and then you might figure out how it hits the ground. Uh, so on the bottom, this is my flat ontology, the horizontal plane, where you have to think of them all independently and work on them independently, which sounds difficult, and it's not, actually. It's just, it's quite interesting to pull the inside out of an outside and work on it. It's quite interesting to pull the articulation off of a mass when you think that it's the same thing um, and work on it, and that's what we've been doing the last few years. Okay, so point number one, mystery. Um, I always judge our work in the office based on um, whether or not uh, you, uh, you know what you're dealing with. And I love this, this way of saying it, not quite knowing what you're dealing with. So it's not totally alien, but it's not something where you, are fully, you fully understand what it is. And you know, the scene where, um, where David Bowman is flying over the monolith in 2001, A Space Odyssey, is a favorite of mine. Um, it appears to be a big black box, and you don't quite know what it is, but as you're flying over it, you realize that it contains all the objects in the universe. And that's the kind of darkness and mystery that I'm interested in. Not a sad darkness, not an, not a, not an empty darkness, but a, a happy darkness that's full of things, like a cornucopia. Yeah, so the orca, the orca keeps coming back. I love this thing. Um, but it's really, as a, as, a, um, as a comparison here to this, I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen this, the supernova that was photographed last week. It's not actually, the funny thing about this is it's not like a, a, an action shot where it's in the process of exploding. That's what it looks like. It's somehow solidified like that. Um, but these things are similar in the sense that, that they're, they're vexing and alluring. Um, uh, uh, and you're not quite sure, like, is this, if you look at the scale of that, you understand and you think that you know what it is. It's out there somewhere, but you don't fully understand its scale. And, and when, we, when we look at these things, or like the orca, it looks like a toy, but you know it can kill you. Um, when you look at these things, you're, you're engaging reality in a new way um, at different scales because of the technology that we have to get that kind of imagery over here, just that kind of way of looking at the world. So, so I, I would really promote engagement um, uh, over this word access, which, um, you know, access to me denotes that you can consume something. And I always try to figure out how you can produce architecture that isn't easily consumable. And, um, and I think that uh, that's one of the best things that, that it can do. Um, is, is to remain in this kind of zone where you can't quite get to it and, it, and there's something in reserve and there's always something more when you, ret when you return to it. So, so I'm going to say that architecture is at its best when it projects alternate realities and avoids mirroring known social systems. And breaking our habitual relationship with the everyday real is the best form of social responsibility. Um, that's not a normal way of talking about social responsibility, but that's what I believe. Um, so... Another example, architecturally speaking, of what I might be talking about um, is conduits versus terminals. Uh, a lot of projects of architecture uh, um, seem to be very interested in flows and in reifying movement of vehicles or humans or other kinds of things, and they end up being a kind of tube structure or, you know, or like a, um, a, a, an implied or reified um, a movement structure that looks like a system. Uh, I, I would vote for the terminal, which is um, looking towards the inside of something, a kind of infinite interiority of architecture, where you're moving from, from uh, nested space to nested space to infinity. So it's an end. It's an end, but it's also infinitely large. This project up on the hill, the Enos House, um, which you can buy for $18 million, apparently. Um, the, Enos, the Enos House, one of my favorite projects, uh, in LA and probably, uh, anyway, uh, in the world. I love this project so much because it's totally indeterminate. Um, so many things are indeterminate in this project. The first thing is like, where did this come from? Who built this? What era is this from? Where are these tiles from? What's going on here? And also, how much, what are the full extents of the house? Like, is, it, is this the house down below? Is that the house? Where's the house? Where's the ground? Is this a mountain? What's going on here? So I just have all of these questions, and I think the questions are very productive, and I enjoy that very much. So not knowing and indeterminacy. Um, this is a project that we did some years ago for the Guggenheim Helsinki, um, uh, riffing on some very, very large volumes, clad in something that was um, on purpose related to 
um, uh, images of, of Viking longships and also uh, stave churches, a kind of a connection back to something from history that's very dark and deep in that culture, but, um, but related to these big chunky volumes kind of dancing on the ground. This is a, a close-up of a project we did some time ago for the Main Museum of Los Angeles Art, uh, which uh, also was really kind of an enclosure around some big, chunky masses as well. And I like this image because it shows the duality of something known like a cafe um, uh, combined with something that is, doesn't seem to at all be from that same reality. All right, there we go. So this is the, um, the next-gen menagerie, uh, um, the house. OK, so, so this is the Dark Chalet project that we have in Utah, and um, a very early model of it here. Uh, I'm, more and more, I'm very much into doing extremely miniature models, which you'll see some of tonight, but extremely miniature models. It's a kind of a black stone lodged in a snow hill, a very, very steep site, Summit Powder Mountain in Utah. So this is the, the big model that we've done for it during construction documents. Um, so it's, it's pretty far along at this point. And um, I guess it's doing a couple of things. One is it's lifting off the ground above the snow hill. And um, uh, this is not the reason why it's lifting up, uh, uh, but it is a ski through site. So everybody who buys a site on this mountain has to allow that you, that you ski through the site and underneath the building. So that was interesting. Um, uh, but we wanted, to, we wanted to levitate and hover over the site. Uh, and then the other thing is that it's black on black, uh, which, which is something that we had to fight for in, in the housing community because the requirements were that this had to be um, mountain modern looking. So this is mountain modern. <laughs> and inside, uh, we're working on this today, actually, there's a 28 foot wide super fireplace, uh, the biggest one in Utah, we think, at least I keep saying that until someone proves me wrong. Um, and I love, <laughs> I, I love, uh, we look back at fireplaces, and I love this so much, the, uh, the Citizen Kane fireplace. It's like a brooding object in the room, right? It's like an act, it's part of the, it's part of, it's one of the actors in the scene, really. Or Frank Lloyd Wright's fireplaces in general, but this one at the Hollyhock is very cool because it, um, uh, it actually has a moat in front of it, which is missing its water, and it's, it's also got a joint to the roof. So these are both like very, very specific entities, almost living, like enchanted entities, almost living in the house. So while we worked on that, we did spend a lot of time yanking the, the, the fireplace out of the, out of the house, operating on it, and, and pushing it back in there to make sure that it had enough discreteness and kind of autonomy to it. There's the section. So um, I'm going to be talking more about these drawings in a, in a minute, uh, but this is what we're calling a Godzilla drawing. And again, I'll, I'll go into details in a second, but, but it's, um, it's a way that we're trying to draw projects that capture a, a lot of its different aspects and dimensions on a single sheet of paper. Uh, um, and, uh, and also um, uh, envision a project in such a way that you can understand its outside and its insides at the same time on the same, on the same drawing. Another drawing, uh, more of the construction documents compiled on there. So, the, um, the, the black on black uh, is gloss black and matte black on the roof. Um, and you'll notice that some of the panels are kind of bent, which is something we've been working on for a, a few years to get away from meshes and grids. And the other thing is just the, the, the figuration or the patchiness that you get from the, from the gloss. Uh, it wraps around mass edges. Um, and this is, I would call it a, a kind of V2 of the tattoos in the office is um, is patches that are still figural, but somehow related to the tectonics of the piece. And, um, and importantly, uh, for this project, and this is probably the only technical slide I will show tonight, uh, truly technical, um, we were able in the gloss areas of the house to embed in a, um, a building integrated solar system using commercial grade solar panels. And uh, that's, that's, why is that interesting? It, of course, everybody has solar on the roof. It's interesting because if you, um, if, you, if you innovate and you can get approval to do something like this on a house, um, it turns out you can, you can generate 400% of the power for the house that, than you actually need. So it sets up a kind of an, a, a whole different idea about what is energy, what's a utility. Um, you can support three other houses around your house. You can sell it back. Or you could just blow all the energy out of the window, which is what, what Tim Morton was talking about last week. Um, 
the idea that, that, um, that efficiency shouldn't drive everything, but pleasure should drive something. So we literally discussed that with this owner, um, the, the idea that you, can have a, um, <laughs> that you can have DJ equipment in every room and have a nonstop party, and it will be a, a, always a net zero project or a net positive project. So, uh, so this is what happens when you try to build a, um, a house like that in a mountain. Um, it feels like, I just want to show this because it felt like we were doing a medieval construction. Um, it's, it's like, it's, it's mind-boggling um, uh, what you need to do to build in that kind of a site. And, and it also is a great testament to the owner that they were willing to do that and they understood that. Um, uh, so this is, whoops, not working. Hold on. I love you. I hope that's not true of all of my. Well, it doesn't matter. So, so this is a picture taken two days ago um, uh, of the steel. The steel is, is about 75% there. It's kind of commercial construction. There's not a whole lot of wood in this house uh, um, uh, because of the way the site is and everything. So it's going along well, and, um, and it's quite exciting for the office to be doing this project. And I don't know what happened there. Oh, there you go. OK. So this is a project that we did, a, a competition in, uh, for Shenzhen for the Science Museum there in April. And, and we, were, um, we, we, we tend to always look at, at sort of um, uh, big, chunky figures. In this case, we were looking at totems um, and the degree to which something can, can have facial qualities um, or is abstract. And, um, and it, it, drove, it drove this, uh, this project. And so these are, these are some of the figures that we started using. Uh, for that project, I'm kind of spiky, um, uh, and and um, and so this is a this is an early model of it. It's a mat. It's a mat building for a gigantic science. Uh, it's for, quite large uh, for a gigantic science museum on a single level. And then there are these vertical towers and figures jammed in the top, um, which make a kind of family of figures. But the important thing is that when they hit the mad building, they also make these involutions, um, it, it, which almost look sometimes like a, a wink or a smile or other things that are going on in this mass, which I, I liked a lot. And, um, and so we started taking that on more. We started thinking about eyeliner and a lip liner and what happens when there's an involution and how to start to uh, emphasize that. Um, and also the idea of colored chrome kept coming up in this project. So these are the kind of colored chrome involutions um, that, that we've been looking at. And a, a quick um, uh, set of, of, of um, elevations. And, and then, um, as part of that way of, of, um, of exaggerating these, these, um, these involutions, we started to project back some of those shapes even further back onto the mass itself. So it's not just the physical uh, geometry of the involutions, but actually projecting it back and creating this black lip liner area, which becomes gloss black on matte black in the project. So, so these are the elevations of it. Um, and uh, one of these drawings that I mentioned before, which we're calling a Godzilla, it's kind of torn open to show you what's going on in the interior. But it also includes a lot of other things uh, it unfolds of the facades or of the lip liner at the top. Uh, um, it includes all the components you need for construction, and it really starts to appear to be like an assembly manual for a, for a model kit. So here's the model kit that we made of it. So you have all of the involutions in there on the left. You have all the pieces that you need to make it. You have multiple scales of the project in there as well. And importantly, you also have the inhabitants and the contents of the building. So it becomes like literally like a flat ontology of everything related to the building, its site, its inhabitants, all the different things inside, the, 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 the collections inside of it, everything is in the model kit. So we, we ultimately, though, um, decided on the, on the black on black version as the final, the final project. So, um, so it's gloss black inside the involutions, uh, mirror gloss black. Three Cyrix students back there. Cyrix alumni, I should say. <laughs> so 
So you can see around the, around the edges of the gloss black, there's this kind of drift around the corners. Cool. OK, um, discreteness. Um, I've, I've talked about this before, but I always like this analogy, the, the werewolf versus Frankenstein. Um, the, the werewolf was such a big analogy for architects in the 90s. Um, we talked a lot about it. Different people had different kinds of, I mean, I remember there was the manimal, and there was the chimera, and there was the werewolf. It was all related to a time where um, we, we were uh, reading a lot of Gilles Deleuze and, and um, trying to figure out how things could become other things, or how things already were something else, the other. Um, and I, I feel like, um, at this point, the, a much better model that, that um, some of us look at is Frankenstein uh, um, uh, assembled out of different parts from different people, yet somehow it operates. Um, and it's not about the smoothness between the parts, but rather uh, you can always see the, the ways that it's assembled. Uh, uh, you can always read that. Uh, James Sterling was an architect who, um, who was definitely interested in parting together parts um, in a very weird way. If you go back and look at, um, at some of his, pro not all of his projects, but some of his projects, very weird the way that this tower appears to almost have four legs on it as if it's walking through the composition. Um, and other elements seem to be like, almost like you could take them apart, but they're almost drifting over and on top of one another. Uh, and I, I always think of this project um, for that reason. So. So um, I want to talk for a second about all of these parts. So, so what is a part, and what is a subdivision, and what is this diagram? Uh, a subdivision is when you take a pie and you cut it up into, say, 12 pieces, and then you have a piece of pie, and you consider that a subdivision. And I would argue that that always um, uh, uh, um, uh, is a kind of undermining of the thing, and especially of the part. So it's like the part can't exist without the rest of it. I much prefer um, this idea of the strange Mariology, which comes from Levi Bryant, where a part, uh, say a cell in your leg, a cell is, is as important and equal but different than the leg itself. So you have parts inside of parts inside of parts. Um, I also think that things inside of other things are very important. So if you have discreteness as a, as a point of departure, you have things next to other things. I think we can all imagine that. But I think that having things inside of other things is also a really cool way, from the idea of strange Mariology, to imagine things organized. So this, of course, is one that we know from Jean Nouvel. Uh, it's like packing things inside of a container, and they sort of start to nudge out. And then from, um, from John Haydock, the cathedral project is kind of amazing because the, it seems like the parts may have been inside at one point, and they're breaching, they're breaching their container. Uh, the snow globe is something, uh, um, another one of my daydreams. The snow globe is a very strange case of a, of a contained world or of parts inside of a contained world. Uh, I love the snow globe because, uh, because basically it allows you to scale and change the relationship of things that you know inside of a world, um, uh, but without killing the world itself. So you know if it's a Tokyo snow globe, you know that there are going to be things in there that are recognizable about Tokyo, but you're going to be able to take the elements of Tokyo and relatively scale them or rotate them or whatever, or transform them to create a new kind of subworld. And that's going to include not just buildings and landscapes and snow, but it's going to include weather and inhabitants and all the other things that might go in, um, uh, into that world. Those are some of our projects. All right. OK, so this is an important slide. Hot off the presses. So OK, so these dark figures, we've been using these for, um, for, for several years. Uh, we've been using jacks and ziggurats and hammers and all these different kinds of things. As the, as, I wouldn't call them the foundation or the basis of the project, not at all. But they're, they're things that we've been working on top of. Uh, either in closing them or, 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 or connecting them together, uh, things that have really strong silhouettes, uh, so very, very strong forms. This isn't a weak form thing at all, very strong forms, and, but things that might have any number of different scales. They might be massive or micro, and, um, and they can be collected, and, they can, um, and, and the way that they're moving around is basically kind of showing how we work on these things. I'm calling it throw it down. So throw it down is, is um, don't finesse it. It's roll those jacks like they're dice. Throw it down is erase something. If you notice, there's a, there was a ziggurat at the top that just disappeared it's like it was flicked off by a giant hand. Um, these things are, are being rotated, scaled, and, and they're, they're 
They're, um, they're constantly in a state of being almost played with like a toy. This is an older project that we did where we, um, we nestled two of uh, what I called at the time sort of minotaur figures inside of a loose, uh, a loose skin. This is the Taichung City Cultural Center. 2012, I think. Okay, so Kinmen. Uh, um, I'll go quickly through this project. I, I'm sure you've seen it. This is now five years old, but it was an important project for the office. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a port terminal in, on Kinmen Island, which is in Taiwan. And um, so it's a, it's a boat terminal. And, and if, if you don't know anything about boat terminals, it's kind of like a, an airport in the sense that it has an, an arrivals level and a departures level. And um, so, so we, we took this as an opportunity to both um, uh, uh, deal with those realities of the, of the levels, but also introduce these mega jacks into it. So they're 50 meters tall. They're, all, um, they're, they're, they're not aligned to gravity. Um, they're off Earth axes, and they're different scales kind of rolling through that thing. So what happens, what happens is that um, inside there are the jacks are these black objects that have, you can see here, you can, uh, there are windows inside of them, and they contain all of the backup that you need, including retail, restaurants, administration, all that kind of stuff, they're, they're really collected inside of these nested figures. Now, one thing about this project that uh, um, was important for the, for the office and something we're still, still dealing with um, is, is the idea of starting to vicariously connect with, um, with things around the building that are not directly adjacent to it. Um, so, so in this case, we, we were looking a lot at the tectonics of the buildings around the area and trying to figure out how to relate without um, mimesis. And, and so we, we found that there's some amazing weird brickwork and weird um, kind of striping and panels and buildings. In, actually, in, in Kinmen Island, buildings have two to three different kinds of patterning within the same building. So, so we took that on um, in this project as well, uh, um, not, not to make it legible necessarily, but as a way of, of riffing on some of that stuff. And we developed these long, weird panels and maze-like patterns and stripes and all these different kinds of things going on in the envelope. Okay. Okay. So, this is Lima. This was a museum uh, in, in Lima, attached to uh, um, a, a, a colonial building. It was an underground museum, which was quite a strange brief. And I know that some other. I know Hernan, you did that. Uh, so, so basically, we we decided to use a tesseract figure, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, a tesseract is basically um, a jammed into a box, the underground level of this thing, and, um, and it gets sheared off um, in, in ways that, um, that increase its figuration. And it basically ends up creating these incredibly complex uh, skylights down into the lower basement area. So, so by shearing it multiple times, you start to get these, um, these amazing kind of figural uh, cavities that, that bring light down into the lower level. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the Korea Museum of Writing, which was a competition, I think now two or three years ago, uh, which um, began in an odd way. We were, we were looking at castles and keeps and, um, and, uh, and other similar types of buildings because of the insane poche that you can find in those buildings, but also, even more importantly, because they're a kind of opaque building type and trying to look into those um, deeper, what, what can we find? Uh, so, so, of course, these plans are amazing um, uh, uh, from, from a lot of these um, Dark Ages and Middle, Middle Ages castles. We, we were particularly interested in the, the simplicity of the center of space and then the, the, the way that all of the circulation and subrooms and, and defensive rooms were all stuffed into the outer thick wall. And we started to play around with the, with the, with the parts that we pulled out of that and attached them to um, a bent box that we needed to do for the galleries. So, so ultimately, um, uh, we, we kind of interpreted those as three-dimensional structures, uh, let's call them figures, that were half in and half outside of the, of, of the container and created a, an entirely different kind of, of museum space, vertical and singular spaces versus a kind of um, a variable, um, variable exhibition space and more flexible space in the middle. 
So this is us wrapping all of that, again, with a skin which has a, um, a, a mutant, a kind of mutant quality uh, where it's both opaque and then also these, these weird, like not perfs, but louvered panels that we got by looking at our own 3D prints, actually, of the project, little miniature 3D prints. And, um, and that has the sense of, of like kind of starting to unify all the different parts, but at the same time, we make sure to leave the joints between the parts expressed as if it could be disassembled almost by giant hands. Uh, we're, we're often undercutting um, objects to the earth. I like this idea a lot of like, of like an architecture not quite, not quite being... Um, not fusing with the earth and having to almost cut underneath it as if you're trying to um, pull it out of the earth or dig out around it. So, so we did that here as well, which also had the effect of unifying a little bit the way the figures hit the box. Yeah. Okay, models. So as Hernan showed, yes, I am of uh, the last um, two and a half, three years, very, very intrigued by models and model kits. And it absolutely comes from when I was a kid on, uh, on some level, but that's not how it started as a kind of secret obsession. And I, I, something that I came back to recently because it started to make more and more sense. Um, What is this? A center for ants! What? How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building? Derek, it's just a... I don't want to hear your excuses! The center has to be at least... Three times bigger than this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, models, models. We all think that we know what models are in architecture. Uh, we make a model, we, we want to study something further, we want to do the massing, or, or on the other hand, you want to um, maybe test a structural, you know, a, a structural system. Um, uh, or whatever it is, but models are often put into servitude um, and, and made to be the kind of weak representation of the thing. Uh, drawing is always put out in front as if it's the real thing, just like um, uh, sculpture versus painting in the arts. Um, and, and so I guess I want to vote back for the, for the model, and in particular for the, also for the model kit. This is, I love this image so much of this 50s Ravel model. Um, the idea that these different scales can all be happening at the same time uh, uh, is, it, it, it reminded me that, that a model kit and just a model in general is a kind of speculative environment. It's not just a representation, a representation of something else at scale, it's its own thing. And in this case, I find this quite hilarious that there are even some of the scale figures are now involved in the construction of this miniature aircraft on the table with this kid watching um, almost in the background. Uh, at the same time, I love, I loved, like I mentioned with snow globes, I love the idea that a model would contain everything in the universe in it. It's not just um, an abstraction of or a cartoon of a thing, but that it is actually the thing. And, and that leads me to the idea that, that, uh, um, uh, uh, that you could potentially take something that's much smaller and blow it up. Uh, model kits, too, are highly differentiated, and they, they include all kinds of, of additional material that I've gotten really into as well. There are like laminated posters of, of even other cars or even competitors' cars in this Lambo kit, there's, um, and there's always a kind of assembly manual, which I like as well. And those, those are also super interesting. The assembly manuals are sometimes so, so detailed that you actually start to think that they're a kind of construction document. The parts also in models, because they're injection molded and not made like we make architecture, uh, at least currently, are, are amazing. I mean, the, the sizes and the morphologies of the parts are so radically different from a tiny little spindly thing to these mega parts. So this is the, this is the West Hollywood Bell Tower project, um, which is a competition that we, uh, that we won in 2015, I think. And the idea was to, first of all, it's a, it's a media object, so it has digital billboards integrated into it. 
but it's also, um, it's also a kind of a civic piece uh, on the Sunset Boulevard right next to Tower Records. Uh, it's about seven stories tall, so it's quite large. And, um, and the idea was to take, rather than having a single board or two boards like you would normally have, to rotate them and create an interiority and then use a tesseract on the inside that gets sheared off to connect everything together. So, but the little model, I still love the little tiny mini models that we have around the office, and I'm obsessed with this. And so, so I, I think that one of the best things that architecture can do is to, is to um, create a sense of, 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 uh, of lack of familiarity or mystery um, uh, by, by losing its fidelity a little bit. There's so much fidelity all around us at all times. And so the idea of blowing that thing up literally is, is really charming to me. So I want to be a real boy. Um, oops. Okay, so this is the piece. Um, that's not the, really the final design, but it's very, very close. Uh, the, the way that it hits the ground is kind of like, I imagine like taking the model and like jamming it in the ground um, where it actually slides into these little channels at the bottom. And then it also has this halftone like graphic element that, that comes out at, at the base of each foot, which we need to do um, as, a, as a, um, a tactile warning so you don't hit your head on the sloping surfaces. So, so this is the construction diagram for it. I call these super components. A super component is something that you can take out of the whole and regard it independently from the whole. So a super component has its own aesthetics and figuration. It's not just a, a square brick. It's not a Lego. It's a, it's a figured piece. So this was the basic diagram for construction. Um, the other thing about this piece, oops, the other thing about this piece is that it was, it's, it's done in partnership with Mocha. And it's a really cool arrangement with them because their, their main, um, now with Klaus Biesenbach and, and the new director, uh, their, their goal is to bring art out of the gallery and into the streets. So, so this for them was a cool way of thinking about some of their artists and how they might be able to take this thing over take over the ground, take over the lighting, take over everything. So it isn't just putting art on a billboard that we know, but it's, it's actually completely taking over the entire thing. So that's going to be part of the project. This is the final construction model of how it'll be built. Uh, we, start, we start building in January. The landscape has changed quite a lot in relation to a lot of city council meetings, but we, we are doing these gigantic um, lanterns that are about 30 feet tall. That's what they look like. That's the one-to-one -one model study. So of course there's a model kit. We're calling this the black edition. And the model kit includes the history of other spectaculars on the strip. It includes the advertising, the cars, the plants around it, the inhabitants, and everything, um, as well as the piece itself and all of its components. OK. OK, so hmm. so last thing about models that I want to say is I'm, I'm thinking more and more about drawing versus models. And I like this idea very much that, that there could be such a thing as a drawing that wants to be a model. And, uh, what I mean by that is, as I mentioned before, is like, first of all, the idea that you could be looking at an object both from the outside and the inside at the same time without having to revert to a picture plane or a flat abstraction of the thing as a plan or as a section or an elevation, but that you could be looking at it all at once and, and in a way kind of not destroying it. So these are two. The Godzilla drawings are, are, are I think, super interesting for that, for, for that way. He's, if you notice, he's not dead. He's not being eviscerated here by this cut. It's a temporary cut because he's still breathing fire, so he's good. You know? And of course, you don't have to cut it with one giant picture plane. His brain has been cut locally. So you, you cut where you need to show something on the interior, but you leave the outer skin intact. So I like that very much. It feels like it doesn't denigrate the Godzilla. It, it brings it alive. It, it gives you more information about it. So the same with these, these aerospace drawings that I love so much. They're, you know, these things are wild. I looked into this, and they, they're not drawn by the engineers of the projects. These are technical illustrators that draw from the thing with all of its skin on. So they see it. They don't have the blueprints. They are not involved in the engineering team, and they have to draw it. So it becomes a speculative drawing of what might be on the inside of the thing. I think that's very interesting and reminds me of the, of the, of the model kit. So, so these drawings that we're doing more and more are these kind of Godzilla drawings or, or speculative kits. There may be a, a kit to build a model. There may be a kit to build the final thing, as this is. It's, and I like, I like having doubt as to which it is. 
So these are some of the other, um, the permit set from that uh, we submitted last month. The, there were no comments from the city. <laughs> so that was great. I, I was waiting to see what they would say. No comments, which is a good thing. Okay, so yeah, so here's some of the chunks. They're gonna be fabricated and shipped like that on very, very large trucks. Um, 13 foot wide by 70 feet long super trucks and, and mounted in, in giant components. Okay, so, um, so back to this idea about drawings that wanna be models. So this is something that, that um, I, don't, I don't, it's kind of a fresh idea, but it's, 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 it's really interesting to me. The, um, uh, the idea that we're always in the computer looking, um, I think this might have come from one of the base camp discussions actually a while ago from Damian. Um, the idea that we're always so used to this interface of like the top view, the front view, the right view, and the perspective as if this is, this is somehow the answer to the Renaissance single picture plane and that this is reality. Uh, and and so, so I was realizing more and more that we're trying to avoid drawing altogether by putting everything in the model and even breaking up the model such that it appears to be a drawing that people are familiar with. So this is kind of what it looks like when you're doing a, what I'm calling a multi-window or a live model where everything can be, can be an ISO, a perspective, an AXO, a front view, a plan. Everything's going on in the sheet um, and can, everything can be adjusted. So, so this isn't, a plan could be here as well. Anything could be here. The funny thing about it is this kind of reminds me of BIM, right? Building information modeling might come up with something like this, but it's not quite there yet, and I don't think it would ever be there. So the intention here, again, is that this is speculative and that you're, you're going to learn something about the piece and constantly adjust it and work on it, but there is no actual drawing. It's a model, and that's it. Okay. All right, landing. Um, Getting closer. So, so landing is uh, um, an idea. It's an idea about um, the way that things hit the Earth. Uh, I like very much the idea of landing and um, something coming down from above rather than growing up from below. I think there's a kind of fundamentalism in the idea that architecture can blow up or grow up from the Earth, um, and it has a lot of a lot of repercussions think about it. So, so I, I'm very much against the idea that context will give you enough information to blow a building up uh, and, and other forms of information as well, but just, the, just generally speaking, it's got to land. It's got to land. Um, I love this model. Uh, I mean, what a better way to land than this, actually on the laser ray of the, of the mouth and then, and then the way that even the laser creates an action on the ground, but the, but the bird itself hasn't touched down. Uh, again, kind of a holy grail, how can architecture do this? There, there are some attempts, you know, some attempts here. Uh, I really love the House of the Gardener from, from Ledoux, which is, a, of, of course, just by, you know, by way of being a sphere, it's going to touch down strangely on the earth, but it doesn't just touch down on the earth. It touches down in a trough or a hole and balances on almost like a molecule, and the most important thing, I think, is that you enter at mid-level. So, so you leave the land, and you go over into the center of the sphere, and then it's like the ground drops out, and you can look up, down, and straight, and you're in a new world. Totally different experience than entering a building at ground level and going up into its extrusion. So the Whitney I love because of the similar idea, but the idea of the bridge, the moving from the city into a different world across a moat over the bridge. So here are some, uh, some diagrams. Uh, uh, a bit after Jeff Kipnis's drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier of sort of uh, uh, um, do and don't do things, never make a landform building, uh, don't turn architecture into a lump. Uh, if you're going to set a, a, a building on the ground, you have to make it fake hover by, by, um, by undercutting it or digging out around it. Uh, you could also defer its landing by landing it on, on another object. Sometimes I call it a, a ground object. There's the in a hole version, and then indifference, where you don't care about what's going on inside at all, but you create a set of new grounds on the interior. This is a very old project, but I was always excited about this ground that seemed to almost peel up off of the land, create a new environment, so you could read land, ground, and then interior. Okay. So, so this is a um, this is a project from uh, I think I don't know last year I think. Uh, that I did together with Stephen Ehrlich, who I saw earlier today, who's here, um, and his office. Uh, very, very interesting project for this guy, Jeff Burns, who, uh, who bought an amazing piece of property up uh, in Nevada. It's an opportunity zone, uh, and there are actually wild horses running around in it. 
Um, uh, and uh, it's an incredible piece of property. It's, qu it's so big you can't quite get your head around it even when you drive around it for a half day. You don't understand the, the, the perimeter of it. Um, and so we had to, when we first started looking at it, we had to throw down uh, LA. This is Los Angeles downtown area, and the site is actually way up here. It's much, much larger than that. Just for reference to, this is the Apple headquarters, and that's an aircraft carrier. So, so just for reference, just for reference, to try to think about you know, architecture at a totally different scale. So what do you do if you're going to design a city um, at that kind of scale with uh, those kinds of possible volumes? What do you do? Do you start gridding it out? How do you lay it out? How do you master plan this thing? It seems like it requires a whole different way of thinking about the parts of a city and maybe differential scaling of those parts and maybe even starting to nest them within one another than, than in this drawing from Leon Creer seems to assume a kind of universal medium-sized scale. Uh, so one of the things that we figured out is, um, uh, I guess one of the things we were really interested in doing is, is fusing together um, a creative space and also manufacturing into, into these hybrid building types rather than just assuming that there's going to be, you know, um, like, like the Tesla factory up there, just manufacturing here and then headquarters is somewhere else. But we realized when you do a building that's, that's a half mile long, like a lot of these buildings are, uh, you have to think about it radically differently. You can't suddenly have retail around the edges and expect there to be street life. You actually have to fold that together and put the city on the interior of the building. So it's a kind of a snow globe. The other thing that happens is like infrastructure can't just be streets on the outside. It's too vast. You can't move around a half mile long building um, without, without, or longer even. I mean, this, I think this one may have been even a mile long. Uh, without interior circulation. So when you start to think about autonomous vehicles and the way that you can have roadways and pathways through a building, it changes it. It's suddenly not a building between a grid, um, but it's, it's, a nested, it's a nested idea. So here's throwing some chunks down on the site, uh, um, which are all quite huge. And uh, this is one of those hybrid buildings um, uh, with, with a nested, um, a, a nested uh, office element and creative space and manufacturing, one of the interior spaces of that. Outdoor space, so also kind of involuting um, some, some shade and some natural environment in the harsh desert, so not trying to decorate the outside really with landscaping, but bring it, internalize it. And, and this is a, an interesting part of it, that, uh, this eSports arena that, that's um, kind of, it's not really in the middle of it, it's just in the space. But the idea that you would have an eSports arena as a center of a city, as a new civic center point, um, quite different than, than Garnier's Paris Opera, where you have a community coming together looking at a screen in, uh, as a kind of unity or, or a shared experience where, where uh, you know, with 2,000 seats, more or less, uh, an esports e arena might be a mega arena, almost like a sphere, looking at a few people playing video games and then watching them play their games on the big screen with maybe 20,000 people. Burton Lumber and then Grant Norris is then taking that lumber? Or is, they, is Grant yeah, Norris that's the same? The, no, I, I typically buy the lumber. <laughs> All right, well, he typically buys the lumber. So um, <laughs> more and more, the, I don't, the, not only is there no time to, to like prepare these shots and all this stuff, I really like that the, the models would be part of everyday life and kind of you know, just sort of integrating with, with not so rarefied, not so abstract, just like the models live with us um, in the office. So this is that guy, Jeff Burns, our, our, our client, our client um, presenting the, the project at Def, uh, DEFCON, DEVCON 4, I think it was, in, in Prague a couple of years ago. OK, so I don't know what just happened. All right, so um, we're getting close. So this is, this is another project, um, uh, the, um, which is in, in Vilnius. And uh, it's, a, it's a concert hall competition that went down this summer. Um, <laughs> And the idea here was to think about the city of Vilnius and its kind of spiry qualities. And anybody who's been there knows, I've heard from people who've been there, that it's, kind of, it's a very spiry city. Um, and the site for the building is on a hilltop uh, uh, just outside the city center. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's quite a, it's, it's, an, it's in a park. Uh, but our idea was to riff on some of the spiry kind of figures that, that we saw in the city. Um, and at the same time, um, try to create a kind of miniature 
almost a miniature city up, up, on the, up on the hillside. So this is something I'm calling more and more vicarious contextualism, which is different than, um, than, uh, than a, let's, let's say, like a local context where you just, you just take things that are literally right next to your building, like you continue a cornice line from the neighboring buildings onto your building, or you continue the landscape up into your project. I like the idea much more like quantum entanglement where you can start to connect discrete elements together by almost like signaling to one another. Um, and it takes a minute to kind of think about what that might mean, but I like that very much that this building can be separated physically from the city, but it can begin to riff on it or, or kind of signal to it. So this is the, this is the project um, on the hillside. Uh, which starts to pick up some of those, those, tall, uh, um, those tall elements. And it actually is just high enough that you can begin to see it from all around the city. So the height was really, really important uh, for us with all the, all the landscaping and trees around. Um, we, we designed this one very much like a model kit. We, were, we had the parts printed out, and, and we kind of jammed them together and worked on it in a very raw, rough way. No fidelity, no, no like high-power computer tools, just very, very raw and rough. Uh, and I think it shows that, and I like that. I like that very much. So here's some of those pieces, um, some other pieces, an early version of the model kit, how it might start to go together. The model that we sent of, uh, as the competition entry, and then uh, the larger final model, where you can see how the um, the project is um, is sliced in a way out of an upper and a lower surface, and the upper surface has these uh, these these towers embedded in it, and it's all sliced together to create a figural window all the way around the edge. It creates a, a panoramic view out to the city. There is no bad view from this site, so that, so that was generally the idea. So the interior are uh, two theaters, a major concert hall and a small black box theater. The, um, the, the space all around it acts as lobby, but also as a kind of intermission zone and even a public space. So, so there's a way for the public to get up inside of it and go back down without entering the theater. Well, sorry. <laughs> ah, you recognize him? OK, we'll just go to that one. So Sarangan, I told you I was showing this. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so uh, um, happy guy, great model, thank you. And uh, these are some other kinds of drawings that, uh, that we, we started doing as part of this Godzilla series, um, some big ISO sections. And, and this is the, the Godzilla drawing. So, so here, again, like trying not to just blow it apart and totally disassemble it, although at the same time we're disassembling it, but try to show, um, capture the, the building both from the outside and the inside at the same time. What's going on with that? Um, so the shadows are very, very important in this project. And they're something that we've been using the last three or four years to, um, for, to different ends. In this case, we're using the shadow of the building to create the ground, uh, uh, which is a public space. And, and we um, uh, uh, basically reifying the shadow on the ground. And then at the same time, we're using the towers to, from a different direction. So these aren't true sun directions, just the idea of a shadow, um, uh, creating some tectonics on the roof here, which start to actually connect the towers better onto the disk-like disc shape. There's the ground object. So the building creates the ground. The, the building doesn't blow up or emerge from the ground. It creates its own ground. Here's the kit for that. And, and inside of the kit here aren't just the parts required to make this building, um, uh, but also some of the neighboring buildings in downtown, the ones that we were specific, specifically looking at. So they're included, they're included in the kit. OK, um, tectonic fictions. Now, um, what is that? So I'm kind of on a mission against this idea of articulation for free. I think articulation for free is what happens to so much architecture when the architect loses control of the project during some time in the process, usually during design development. 
um, and things happen to it. Uh, you start to get seams and joints and uh, materialities that you didn't want to have. Uh, um, you start to get uh, industry telling you how to build something uh, in usually human, me, very, I just call them medium-sized components, small things like shingles, panels, sticks, all the things that are readily available and can be carried usually by one or two people. Um, and I think that's, that's a kind of articulation for free that, that is a, um, a real issue for architecture. And I think one of, our, one of the things we can do is to try to be aware of that and surpass it. The other thing is the articulation that we sometimes get for free in the computer. And I think, uh, um, I think we have to be really careful about the logic that underpins this kind of uh, a variable mesh idea or just uniform mesh idea over objects. Because basically, this is a, this is a kind of a... Um, a, a, a um, a, a calculus. This is a calculus, and this isn't adding anything to the form. In fact, it's kind of breaking it down into, into very small parts. So I think that both of these things have a way of kind of undermining the architectural idea. Um, I love the SR71. Uh, no hardware, maybe some if you get really close. No hardware, no traces of how it was built. Um, it breaks that relationship between how a thing was built and the architectural effect, which is very similar to, I think, the importance of breaking the relationship between the computer tools that are used between, uh, on a project and the expression of the architecture itself. Sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening. So tattoos and medicine still, still going strong in the office. Uh, like I said, a kind of version 2.0. Uh, um, I, I, I think the basic idea of the tattoo is that it also has objecthood and that it can drift and move around on top of a mass rather than looking at, kind of, at a kind of foundation of a mesh emerging from the surface, it's put on top of the surface and it can drift and move and take many different kinds of, 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 um, of roles in the, in the reading or misreading of a project. This is a um, REMS project in uh, CCTV in Beijing. It's a, it's a great project that uses what I call meta-seams, which is a seam that, that doesn't necessarily need to be there, although it might, it might have a functional uh, uh, connection, but it doesn't necessarily need to be there. I like very much the way that this thing almost seems like a toy in the city. If you look at the, the regimentation of this building here and all of its articulations, this thing seems to, through that strange meshwork that runs across it, it actually, um, it's a nice bait and switch move where you don't look at the tiny little pieces of material in the curtain wall because you're looking at the other pattern. Okay. Um, so, so patchiness uh, um, is, is one of the outcomes of that way of thinking. Um, it's not just universal white cat, but uh, the idea that you could start to break down a mass. And, and I think we all know how different a patchy cat looks than a purely white cat. Uh, it, it's very strange how you can actually kind of destabilize a mass through patches. These are some older projects where we're using tattoos. And I think, yeah, so, so this is Vilnius again, uh, a close-up shot of how, how, the, um, how the, those shadows start to begin to create a patterning and a tectonic that, that virtually connects the, the spire elements with the disk element. Um, it's a kind of crossover element, but you can also read it as its own independent element on, on, the, on the roof. And so, okay, and this is, a, um, this is a piece from a toy designer that I like a lot, um, Joe Ledbetter. He's a local LA toy designer. And uh, it's been looking at this for a long time and reached out to him recently. So interesting the way that, you, that he gets, um, he can confuse when something is a mass move and when something is a graphic move. For instance, this there, it's not that clear if it's just graphic or mass. Or here, not, not that clear where it's graphic or mass. So he's using reflections and shadows also on these toys to create secondary effects and either emphasize or de-emphasize something on the, on the mass. So I like that a lot. And, um, ah, sorry. Killing me. I don't know what's going on here. Sorry. So uh, I reached out to Joe, and um, and we, we've been talking now about this for a while. We gave him. He came to the office, and we gave him a model uh, of the the, Shen, the Shenzhen project. Talked about it for a long time. He took it back to his studio, and he's been working on it. And this is the this is the outcome. And I thought it was it was so interesting to. Um, go the opposite way, to take a piece of architecture that's intended to be at a certain scale and then turn it into a toy. Uh, and and w we don't know what to do with it yet or what the outcome is, but, but, um, but it's a, it's, I'm really excited about it. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>